it's a great pleasure to invent uh, to have uh, Mikhail Baskalis speaking today, and I'll say a few words about him in a moment. Uh, his topic is a very interesting and unusual one: Latin in Greece between Greek East and Latin West. Now, those of you who know the writings of the late Philip Sherrod and his book, The Greek East and the Latin West, will be aware that that distinction between the two things can be very uh, trenchant and polemical. And it exposes one of the big questions at stake in this seminar series, what is Europe and whose is Europe? And sometimes people who are Greek have a different answer. This is a big set of questions then, but it's also one that can be explored and will be today at the level of detail. And we're in the happy position that Professor Pascalis is someone who does the big picture and he does detail. He's been for some years uh, Professor Emeritus of Classics at the University of Crete, Brethimno, where he taught for many years. And he has a very wide range of contributions to the study of European literature starting with a degree in Bologna, moving on to a PhD on Livy and Sallust, an OUP monograph on the Aeneid, and then over time, a enormous number of contributions across the whole range of Greek literature from the Hellenistic period right up to today. And in recent years, with a special concentration, among many other things like the ancient novel and its legacy on certain key modern Greek figures who've thought about the kind of question we're thinking about today. Adamandios Korais, Andreas Calvos, on whom Professor Pascalis has a prize-winning book, Dionysios Solomos, the national poet, on whom he's got a, unless it's out, a forthcoming book, coming very shortly. And in the meantime, a prodigious flow of articles, always enlightening, often trenchantly revisionist, and in a large proportion and concerned with themes of classical reception, such as bring us together in this seminar. And today's theme is a very interesting and paradoxical one. It's how the Greeks deal with this question of Latin. We've got the ideal interlocutor for today, who will get a slightly longer introduction next week when it's her show. Uh, Constanza Gutenka won't need any introduction to attendance of the seminar, but it's worth pointing out that her first monograph, um, Placing Modern Greece, the Dynamics of Romantic Hellenism, um, is an important contribution to the study of Solomos and this question of national identity, as we were considering last week with Charlie Lauth's very interesting paper about Herdelin. So the same um, conventions apply as in previous weeks. Our speaker will talk for 15 minutes, uh, we'll get a short response from our interlocutor, and those will be recorded in case you want to play it back for your delectation. Um, then we'll break for 10 minutes for the traditional comfort break, but also importantly, so that um, the two people chairing it can just go through the chat box and see how we should order the flow of questions. And then we'll resume for an unrecorded session of uh, question and answer with our speaker and interlocutor. So it's a very great pleasure to have a speaker on a topic that happens to be of considerable interest, selfish interest to me. Uh, and we've got a handout which has been put in the chat box, which will certainly facilitate your um, appreciation of the talk. Um, over to you, uh, Mikhail Paschalis. Thank you very much, David, for your uh kind words, and uh, so uh, the title is of the topic is Latin in Greece between Greek East and Latin West. Towards the end of 1353 or the beginning of 1354, Petrach received from the Byzantine dignitary Nicolaos Sigiros a manuscript of Iliad, which the latter had promised to send him when they met in Verona in January of 1348. In Verona, Petra conversed with Sigiros in Latin, with which the latter as a diplomat was familiar. Sigiros was acquainted with aspects of Latin literature, considering that some classical Latin texts had been translated into Byzantine Greek in the second half of the previous century. 
translations of Latin literary works in a variety of genres had appeared in Constantinople after the restoration in 1261 of the Byzantine rule in the city, which had been occupied in 1204 in the course of the Fourth Crusade. Most of them are attributed to the famous polymath Maximus Planudis, 1255-1305. They include four prose translations of Latin text that represented bestsellers in the medieval West, Cicero's Somnium uh, Scipionis with Macrobius' commentary, Boethius's De Consolatione Philosophia, and Ovid's Heroides and Metamorphoses. All the views treated these translations as mere literary exercises, but in recent years, it has been argued that despite occasional errors and questions about his grasp of Latin, Planudis is a competent translator and expected his Greek audience to consider them worthy of serious study and scholarly investigation. On January 10, 1354, Petrarch wrote to Sigeros to thank him for the Homeric manuscript. He already possessed the manuscript of Plato, but this new Greek possession stirred in him a novel effusion of feelings and emotions caused by an emerging desire for learning. Among other things, his reply contained the following moving and famous passage, number one on your handout. Without your voice, your Homer is mute to me, or rather, I'm deaf to him. Still, I rejoice even to look at him, and often, as I embrace him, I say, sighing, oh, great man, how ardently would I listen to you. Petra's Greek was too poor for him to read the precious manuscript because of the Greek lessons he had been given by the monk Varlaam in 1342, uh, which has, has, had lasted only briefly. Unlike Boccaccio, who will have the privilege to associate with Leontius Pilatus for almost three years, listening to him, reading Homer, and conversing with him. Nevertheless, Petra's thirst for learning, this can be sitting, he calls it in his letter to Sigeros, seems to have set in motion the rise of interest in the Greek language and contributed to the first Latin translation of the Homeric epics by Leontius Pilatus on behalf of Giovanni Boccaccio. Petrarch received the translation of the Iliad and the Odyssey between 1366 and 1368, more than 12 years after the time he was given the Homeric manuscript. Earlier in the same Petra, uh, the same letter, sorry, Petrarch writes the following, number two on your handout. You send me as a gift Homer, whom Ambrosius Macrobius calls the source and the origin of all divine invention. And if all were silent, the thing speaks for itself, but it is a truth everyone recognizes. I, I quoted only one source, he means Macrobius, out of many, because I am certain that of all Latin writers, this one is most familiar to you. The source Petrarch mentions here is Macrobius's com commentary in Somnium Scipionis 2.10.11, and he may be alluding to the fact that Sigeros was familiar with it through Planudis's Greek translation. Actually, a manuscript of this translation contains corrections and additions by the hand of Sigeros. The point I'm trying to make is that the meeting in Verona of Petra with Sigeros, which prepared the Italian Renaissance by promoting the rediscovery in the West and translation into Latin of Greek literary texts coming from the East, Petra writes that Homer came to him from the far edge of Europe, uh, ab Europa il ultimis. I mean, this meeting was preceded by the revival in the East of an interest in classical Latin literature, which was translated into Greek, a development most probably caused by the creation of an audience for it on account of the Latin occupation of Constantinople from 1204 to 1261. Just as knowledge of Greek had been lost, quote unquote, in the West during the Middle Ages, in analogous terms, knowledge of Latin had been lost, quote unquote, in Byzantium, except where practical purposes required it, such as reading religious works pertinent to the theological debate with the West or contacts with the Latin speaking world. But while in the West, the unity of Greco Roman culture was re established through the discovery of Greek antiquity knowledge of Latin language and literature in the East will remain restricted and conditioned by historical developments and circumstances. 
The Christian Church schism of 1054 had created a permanent gap between Catholic Latin West and Christian Greek East. The agreed reunion 15 years before the fall of Constantinople met with almost universal rejection in the East. The division had widened from the 11th century onwards, especially due to the Western aggression against the East in the form of campaigns included to liberate Jerusalem from the Arabs, which eventually led to the conquest of Constantinople in 1204, the creation of a Latin empire, and later the division into Latin states of the territory, which is roughly identified with modern Greece. The, the conquerors spoke early versions of Italian and French, but the language of the administration, the Catholic Church, and learned individuals was Latin. The territories that resisted the Ottoman expansion for a longer time, like Crete and especially the Ionian Islands, retained the knowledge of Latin also for a longer time. In the rest of Greece, knowledge of Latin was conditioned by European conducts, the existence of a Greek diaspora, the emergence of uh, Greek enlightenment, etc. The first king of Greece was from Bavaria, and so Greece adopted the Bavarian educational system. In 1836, the teaching of Latin was introduced in secondary education, and a year later in university education, foundation of the first university in Athens. In the former case, it included both language and literature, but some 40 years ago, it was limited to language courses alone, taught in the last two classes of Lycion, until the Syriza government abolished it altogether. It has now been reintroduced by the current government. Perhaps because of its association with the conflict of the Orthodox with the Catholic Church, with conquest and occupation, and eventually with the Bavarians, Latin language and culture never became popular in Greece contrary to what happened in antiquity when the Roman conquerors embraced Greek, Graecia, Capta, Ferrum, Victor, and Capita, and in the West, where the Northern conquerors of Western Europe embraced Latin. Now we move to number three on your handout. It should not escape us that Greece, which gave so much to Christianity, did not bequeath to the West something like Virgil's fourth epilogue. Since the time of his death, Virgil has always had an immense impact the word is epivoli in Greek, on the West. He always remained at the top of the pyramid of the Western tradition. Virgil is the most important available point of reference when we want to compare the tradition of Western Europe with the Greek tradition. I mean, not the ancient Greek, but the, Greek, but the entire Greek tradition. Yes, I feel that Eliot and Odin do not belong, do not belong to Homer's, but to Virgil's world, uh, which uh, were very different, and with the passage of time became even more. That is what George Ferris wrote in his 1965 essay, Digressions from the Homeric Hymns. I know of no other modern Greek poet who displays such a deep consciousness of the importance of Virgil for the shaping of the Western tradition, and let me add an analogous consciousness for the importance of Homer for shaping the Greek tradition. What is most surprising is that Seferis' knowledge of Latin was elementary, and he relied mainly on translations, especially French. He did not come from a region where Latin was once a familiar language. He may have had some Latin in school, and his father was professor of law at Athens University, but both factors do not seem to have played a role in his engagement with Virgil and Latin literature. So what was it that sparked his interest in Virgil and Latin authors like Apuleius, whose metamorphosis influenced six nights on the Acropolis and challenged his poor knowledge of Latin for more than 30 years? According to the passage quoted above, it was the consciousness of their impact on Western literature, which he first acquired during his student years in Paris, 1918-1925, and later through his discovery of the poet and critic T.S. Eliot. As regards the Aeneid, it was primarily Dante and T.S. Eliot who triggered his interest in it. For the Eclogues, it was their passionate reader, André Gide, and especially his works Palude, Swamps, and the Promete Mal Enchaîné, Prometheus Ilbound, of which the Greek poet has left us some unfinished translation now in the Yanadios library. I have been working on them for some years. Indeed, references to Virgil in Seferis' essays concern his influence, his importance for the Western canon and intertextuality. The last one is secondhand because of his poor knowledge of Latin. Virgil's role as Dante's guide in Inferno and Purgatorio, to which he comes back again and again, 
beginning with six nights on the Acropolis, seems to have been a crucial influence on Seferis' understanding of Virgil's importance for the Western literary tradition. In his essay on Erotokritos, 1946, he stresses the debt of Renaissance to Virgil and classical Latin poetry, and comments in particular, number four on your handout, uh, on the dependence of a simile of Erotokritos on Ariostos Orlando Furioso and the latter's dependence on Virgil's Aenea. De deriving his information from Constantino Theotokis' notes incorporated in Stephanus Xanthudidis' introduction to his edition of Erotokritos. Theotokis came from Corfu and knowledge of Latin and Italia belonged to this island's heritage. Severus knew only a little of both, but he possessed the critical mind that permitted him to draw the necessary conclusions from Theotokis' comments, especially that behind Cornaros' simile there lies not direct acquaintance with Homer, but a chain of imitations. The lines of Dante's Purgatorio were stasis, the Latin poet of the Flavian age, bends in order to embrace the feet of Virgil, treating shades like solid things, tratando l'ombre come cosa salda, recurs three times in Seferis. Being a passage that concerns poetic succession, it is emblematic of Seferis' conception of Virgil's impact on Western literature. T.S. Eliot, T.S. Eliot's essay is What is a Classic, 1945, and Virgil and the Christian World, 1957, deepens Seferis' understanding of Virgil's importance for Western literature. But in spite of his admiration for, for Eliot, he did not hesitate to criticize him on a central issue of the second essay, commenting on Eliot's statement, uh, number five on your handout, that his, that is Virgil's, sensibility is more nearly Christian than that of any other Roman or Greek poet, Seferis replied as follows in 1965. Quote, in this essay, Eliot seems to disregard parts of Homer, for instance, Book Six, The Farewell of Hector and Andromache, or 24, The Meeting of Primer and Achilles, uh, parts of Iliad, he means, of course, which seem to me to be so close to a man's soul that cannot be alien to the deeper meaning of Christianity. We have come back to where we started, to Homer and Virgil, to Latin West and Greek East, with Christianity claimed uh, by both sides. In his poem, Last Stop, Teleftheo Stathmos, number six on your handout, Seferis will use Virgil's memorable phrase, uh, Amica silentia luna, it truncated, okay, it's not per amica, but amica, under the friendly signs of the moon, rendered by the poet as Siopes Agapimenes de Selinis, in order to allusively equate the Greek diplomats, officers, and dignitaries stationed at Cava dei Tireni in southern Italy and about to return to Greece in October of 1944 with the Achaeans about to return to Troy from Tenedos and conquer the city concealed in the belly of the wooden horse. The Greeks from Italy looked forward to cashing in their real and especially their non-existent services, just as the Achaeans looked forward to the spoils from captured Troy. The metaphorical conquest of Greece by Greeks coming from the West would be an ironic reversal of the conquest of Greece by Latin West, but on a metapoetic level, it amounts to a gesture on Seferis' part of extending Virgil's influence to the Greek literary tradition. The wooden horse was the archetypal stratagem and Seferis comments on it in his 1966 essay on the 700 years of Dante in connection with Odysseus's faith in Canto 26 of Dante's Divine Comedy. The poet possessed the 1959 French Bidet edition of the Aeneid and had read the wooden horse section of Aeneid too. But I believe that he came to realize and recognize the significance of Peramica Silentia Lunae thanks to its recurrent use in Western literature, as in Hugo, Gide, Yeats, also in Borges, 1951-1981, after the publication of Last Stop. Last on your handout is a poem by Hugo. Thank you very much. Many thanks for that incisive paper with a lot of the things that fuel the dialogue in these seminars, the importance of translation, the importance and paradoxes of cross-cultural uh, contact and tension, uh, and also, as we've seen with the poem Last Stop, 
with the politics of literature. So we'll move straight on to Constanza as interlocutor and off you go, Constanza. Okay, <clears throat> thank you very much. So in this brief response, I'm going to make two points basically. One is about the difficulty of pinning down the East-West categories in the generation of notions of Europe. And the second, um, the second point, which is going to be a shorter one, is about the role of Latin as a key to vernacular traditions. Now, Michali started from, from Petrarch and the underlying Byzantine knowledge of Latin translated into Greek. Um, he mentions Macrobius in the context, and Macrobius is one of the, the authors <coughs> cited also by, by Petrarch in his correspondence with C.A. Ross. Um, Macrobius himself described himself in the preface to the Saturnalia, one of his other works, as a man born under alien sky, um, which is probably North Africa. So there is something about these constant movements, these constant displacements um, that, that undo or that sort of add a third dimension also to this back and forth between East and West. If nothing else, East and West are very relative terms and their flexible dialectic has played a key part in narratives and expressions of European identity, in fact, since antiquity. In their back and forth, Europe as a concept arises exactly from that movement. Europe in general is an imaginary construct arising out of acts of transition and translation. Um, I think Deepesh Chakrabarti has written on this with a particularly strong focus in his book from the mid 90s, Provincializing Europe, which very much makes this movement um, of looking at Europe, not as, the, not as the center, but of Europe as a, a province from other points of view. In terms of these acts of transition and translation, we've heard about translation already a number of times in the, in the last couple of weeks. And one interesting point when it comes to the East-West movement, especially in the period uh, Michali started his talk with, is of course also the political question of the translation imperii, which is a cultural translation at the same time. When it comes to the Latin knowledge of, of Greek as well, of course we see a translation from Troy to Rome, but from where then? There's then a translation either to the Latin West, but there is as much a translation from Rome back to Constantinople. And we can see in the back and forth of the Latin West and Byzantine writing that this translatio imperii can, can work in either direction. Since Michali started with Petrarch reading Homer, I wanted to take a brief look at the Latin Homer in general to give you an example of just how complex and mutually entangled this back and forth of Latin West and Greek East or of East and West and of Latin and Greek is. When it comes to the knowledge of Homer, in the late antique and medieval West. Um, people mostly relied on Latin texts such as the accounts of the Trojan War by Dictis the Cretan and Daris the Phrygian. Those are Latin texts from the fourth or sixth century, though in the case of Dictis there's possibly a Greek version. These were the texts, texts that had the largest impact on the vernacular romances, especially in French, and on such fashions as the Roman de l'Antiquité, or, for example, the Roman de Troyes, a 12th century text by Benoît de Saint-Maur. Saint-Maur's Roman de Troyes, in turn, is the basis for a Greek version called Opolemos tis Troados from the 14th century, written in political 15-syllable verse in vernacular Greek and produced in the highly hybrid culture of the Frankish Morea, meaning the Peloponnese under Frankish crusader rule. I saw earlier that Elizabeth Jeffreys is, is on the call. She probably knows more about this text than anyone else, certainly in this call, but probably in general, since she edited it a number of years ago. The, uh, the War of Troy, the Polymos Tistroados, also includes elements of a Manassas, a Manassas 12th century Byzantine historical synopsis, so a work of historiography. So you can see how, how hybrid this text is already. 
To add another turn to the screw, the text is then collected from the late 18th century onwards and into the 19th century in the Pel Peloponnese as an example of vernacular Greek poetry um, under the auspices of the return of foreign scholars and collectors from the European West. Now the Frankish Morea um, was an area that unlike the Peloponnese now, which we think of as a central part of Greece and the central part of Europe, at the time was really provincial from any possible point of view. Um, it was a Frankish kingdom, it was on Greek ethnic territory, it was a Byzantine outpost, it was a Frankish outpost. So in many ways, from whichever center you chose to look at it, it was somewhere far out there. Michalis also mentions the complex map of Greece when it comes to the tolerance level towards Latin. Um, so within the territory of modern Greece, uh, the Ionian Islands, for example, culturally stayed much, much closer to Italy. Um, Crete was under Venetian rule for a couple of centuries. The Frankish dominions also as a result of the Crusades um, had big effects in Cyprus, which again, to just bring in another example, led to a hybrid poetic production of Cypriot chivalrous poetry, which was strongly influenced by, by um, French models. Interestingly, I think, or, or symptomatically, it is precisely George Seferis again, who was very keen to revisit all of these traces which these exchanges left on Greek poetry. And Seferis is, of course, not only um, the Nobel Prize winning uh, poet of densely modernist poetry, but also in his essays and in his writing and thinking, he had enormous impact on the literary historiography of modern Greek literature. And he was very keen on rediscovering, unearthing <clears throat> very hybrid traditions of, um, of Greek poetry in very close and constant exchange with other European and further, further field literary and poetic traditions. So from Seferis' point of view, there's a strong fascination, not only with Virgil, for example, as part of literary canons and traditions, but also with all the post-Latin vernaculars, um, whether it's Occitan French, uh, the French of the Roman, um, whether it is Italian, and they're interlacing with the Greek language and his emphasis on the Greek language and the development of the Greek language in exchange with these foreign impulses was very, very key to Seferis' uh, thinking and his practice as a poet. This gets me to my last or second point, um, that about the vernacular. I think it's important, I mean, it, in a way it's a, it's a truism, but I think it, it bears pointing out very strongly that when it comes to European identities and the question of the classical in European identities, Latin was of course not only a lingua franca and a means, an instrument of exchange and communication for a very long time, but it was the basis of the transition to the vernacular. Dante, who Michalis mentioned a number of times in his talks, in his importance both for, for Petrarch and the, the early Renaissance, but also in his importance for Seferis. Dante is, of course, not only the author of the Divine Comedy and its emphasis on Virgil, but Dante was just as much read, certainly in a Greek context, as the author of a dialogue, De Vulgari Eloquentia, about the value of the vernacular and the possibility of writing in the vernacular. Dionysio Solomos on the Ionian Islands in the early 19th century, um, craft his own dialogue, the Dialogos, which is also about the question of vernacular writing in Greek. And Seferis himself has a dialogue on poetry, which more indirectly than Solomos maybe, but still um, thinks about the question of what the Greek language and what a, a Greek vernacular literary tradition is and could be. So in that sense, um, Dante is very important as a key to the importance of vernacular languages in Latin, especially as the basis of European identities. Latin is a key player that has often been hidden or masked by modern European Hellenisms, 
Um, I'm also conscious that there's a good number of early modernists in the audience. So I think for them, this is, of course, perfectly normal. But I think because we, we tend to come from the, the late end of modernity, if you want, um, the, the Latin is often overtaken uh, by, by notions of European Hellenism, um, even though it's often pushed against the Latin, that is. But at the same time, I think Latin is also something extremely plurivocal and multivalent in its associations. Latin is always an implicit part of the story. And in the Greek case, the tension with the Greek identity, with the Greek modern national identity, has been particularly visible. But maybe it is visible symptomatically so, with a view to other Europes as well. Thank you. <laughs>